Okay, I'm John Tanner. I'm president of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. It looks like it's a hip crowd today, but um, the Washington County Public Affairs Forum is a service of the Washington County Public Affairs Forum, and we try to bring uh, speakers uh, to the public, give the opportunity to uh, see and hear from the people who represent us or seek to represent us. The uh, forum's been around since 1956, and I think the banner over there, which you probably can't see, is sort of the document of proof that I rely upon when I make that representation. But in any event, today we have the first congressional district candidates, um, Suzanne Bonamici and Jason Yates, and both of them are going to have eight to ten minutes to explain their um, philosophies and why they ought to be elected, and then two minutes of rebuttal at the end, and then we open for questions. This is going to be an opportunity for our Vice President, uh, Mr. Solomon, um, to handle the questions. I have to leave at 12.30, but I'll supervise the first portion and then the questions. And again, the questions are succinct from forum members on hopefully one subject calling for uh, responses from either or both of the uh, candidates. So again, in our traditional, at least for the last couple of months, uh, position of having the incumbent go first, we'll um, ask uh, Congresswoman Bonamici to start. Thank you so much, John. I'm Suzanne Bonamici, for member. And I'm so honored to be your representative in the United States House of Representatives. And I'm running for re-election because I have spent my entire adult life and my career standing up for seniors and consumers, helping small businesses and improving public education. And because many years ago, my grandparents crossed the ocean on a boat through Ellis Island for an America where everyone could succeed and their children and their grandchildren would have a better life. And that's the America that I want and that's why I'm running for Congress. And I actually worked my way through community college. I started at Lane Community College, college and law school at the University of Oregon, go Ducks. And I, and Beavers, Beavers, Beavers fans here too, we like the Beavers. Uh, I worked my way through uh, by working at Legal Aid in Lane County and I knew from helping low income families that people don't struggle by choice. They were struggling because they'd lost a job or lost a spouse or had medical bills that they didn't anticipate and couldn't pay. And then after law school, I moved to Washington, D.C. to work for the Federal Trade Commission, where I worked on consumer protection. And I went after mortgage brokers who were defrauding people out of their money and often their homes. I met my husband, Michael, in Washington, D.C., and then we moved back to Oregon, where I joined a small law firm and worked for a couple of years. Most of my practice was rec uh, representing small business owners. Then I had two children, Andrew and Sarah. They went through the Beaverton schools and I took a career break and got very involved in my community doing volunteer work in schools and for nonprofit organizations. And then in 2007, I was elected to the Oregon House of Representatives and then appointed and elected to, this, to the state senate where I served two terms. And in the Oregon legislature, I was a leader on consumer protection issues. I worked with Business Oregon to help small businesses access capital. And I uh, worked on improving education, reducing standardized tests, removing mandates for our schools. And in the legislature, I earned a reputation for being able to work together, get things done, and also for my integrity. And now, at the end of my first full term in Congress, I feel like I just got started. I've continued with the values that I've ra I was raised with, uh, and I brought to the Oregon legislature, I brought those values to Congress. Now, I know from talking with people around this great district that I'm honored to represent, which includes all of Washington County, but also all of Yamhill County, Clatsop County, Columbia County, and part of Multnomah County, I know from talking with people around the district, people are feeling insecure. Now we've seen some positive signs since the recession, you know, things were really at the low point in 2008, 2009. We've seen some positive signs, but we still have a lot of work to do. But I know that people want us to be enacting policies that bring about security 
and stability. Things like investing long term in transportation and infrastructure. And in my position on the Education and Workforce Committee, I've been working on reducing the cost of higher education. I paired up with a Republican colleague to pass a financial counseling bill through the House that will help students understand their repayment options and their obligations when they get loans and grants. But I know we have more work to do to reduce the cost of higher educa education. We have more work to do to reform No Child Left Behind, so we're reducing the emphasis on standardized testing and having a well-rounded education for all of our students. That includes art, music, and career and technical education. And for my position on the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, I know there's great potential, especially here in the first district, for what we can do with technology. And I know, I've, uh, because I've earned a leadership position on the Environment Subcommittee and the Committee on Science, Space, and Technology, I know about the potential for renewable energy and technologies that we're developing right here in Oregon and how those can build the economy. Now, when I first started in Congress, I served on the Budget Committee for several months, and I know, I know that we have a debt and a deficit to address, although we've been getting a lot better with the deficit as our economy is improving. But I know we need to do that with the right priorities, and I understand, as do my constituents, we don't need to cut or privatize Social Security or Medicare in order to address the, the issues with the budget. So I know there's a lot of work to do uh, can, to continue as your representative in Congress. I've earned a reputation as I did in the legislature of being able to work together to find common ground with my colleagues. I was proud to work on and help pass and attend the bill signing for the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act that's going to help with uh, job training around this great country. I'm proud to have several bipartisan bills that I've passed through the House, working with my Republican colleagues on the Science Committee. Things like the Tsunami Warning and Research Act, so important to the coastal communities. And another thing that I'm proud of is that I have earned endorsements across the district from leaders in, in state and local governments, mayors, county commissioners, and not just Democrats. People on both sides of the aisle are supporting my reelection, and they want me to, rep to continue with my representation in Congress because I've been able to uh, not go in with the partisan games that are being played, but instead find common ground, work together, and represent this district with integrity and get things done. Now, I know my grandparents, if they were still alive today, would be very proud of what their granddaughter is doing. Uh, and I'm proud uh, to, to represent you. And I'm glad for the Washington County Public Affairs Forum for giving us the opportunity to be with you today. I look forward to answering your questions, and I would be honored to get your vote in November. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jason Yates. I'm also running for the U.S. House of Representatives. And just a little bit about me. Everyone asks, why are you running for Congress? Well, if we look at what Congress is doing and the approval rating that Congress has at 9% right now, that's one of the reasons why I'm running. The best kind of federal government that we could possibly have is a federal government that we barely see. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments of the U.S., the Bill of Rights, give the states most of the power of the country. Very few things are allowed to be done by the federal government, so it should be a hands-off government. Another thing, the card that I have on my table, on the back of the card it shows a picture of my family. I have two young sons. I have a five-year-old named Ezra, and a, a five-year-old named Caleb, and a two-year-old named Ezra. I know that one day they're going to ask when they're old enough to understand, Dad, why is it so bad? Why is the job economy so bad? Why do I have to pay so many taxes? Why didn't you do anything? Well, I'm standing up for them and for your children and your grandchildren now. Because right now the government is overregulated. There's too many taxes and there's too many burdens on everyone's family. The national debt just hit $17.8 trillion, and that's only the surface that we see. That's not even the $100 trillion of unfunded liabilities. 
we have to get this under control now. And it's going to take hard cuts across the board. Yes, we may have to cut programs that are helping, but if we do not get the debt c under control now, it won't matter because no programs will exist in the future. We have to take control now because this is a debt that we are not going to be able to pay back. This is not something that even that our children will be able to pay back. But if we start making steps now to get this under control, then our children and our grandchildren will have a brighter future. Congress, most of the leaders in Congress have failed on both sides of the aisle. We have failed leadership on both sides. The Speaker of the House isn't standing up to the scandals of the presidency. And we, we can see that every tax that comes through, the Democrats always vote for. Now, just because I am endorsed by the Republican Party does not make me a Republican. When you go to Congress, you take an oath to the Constitution of the United States, not to the Republican Party platform, the Democratic Party platform, or your own personal party platform. You swear an oath to the Constitution. You have my oath now that whether or not a Republican or a Democrat gives me a bill, if a bill supports the Constitution, I will vote for it. If it does not, or if it takes rights away from the states, I will vote no. This may mean that you see a thousand no votes from me before you see a yes. I would much rather protect your rights by standing up against the wrong than forcing you to have to deal with a bad decision. Two of the main issues that are affecting the first district are education and jobs. Common Core, as we can all see through Facebook and social media of teachers and parents posting these weird math problems where you have to count up and count backwards and count sideways. Why do we need to change math? Why do we need to change all these things? Why can't we allow, like the Ninth and Tenth Amendment provide, the states to decide how they would like to teach their children? We don't need a cookie cutter program on the federal level telling us how common our children need to be. Our children need to be taught to be extraordinary, to be world leaders, to be able to stand up and be able to invent new products, build new businesses, open up new industries. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is to allow each state to decide what is best for their children. Other, the other important point is jobs. The job economy is terrible right now. People are searching for jobs. Since President Obama took office, I was unemployed for 18 months because I couldn't find work in the area that I was trained in. And I was trained in warehouse management. Well, warehouse management have to deal with some big industries at some point. Well, these industries didn't want to hire extra people because of taxes and over-regulations. We have to take down those barriers so businesses can succeed. Because when businesses succeed, they're able to put money into new products, new services, new equipment, and most importantly, new employees. If our country is allowed to take back a couple of steps on the taxes, we will become a world superpower by people seeing this is a place where we need to invest money. The United States of America is where we should open our business. Companies from around the world will flock to America to start their business and hire American employees, which will open every industry across the board. Now, I've been running my entire campaign on four points. And those points are Obamacare. Right now, the overregulation is causing multiple people, millions of people, to not have health insurance. Let's deregulate Obamacare and let's allow each business within each state, each insurance company, to be able to sell over state lines. This competition will drive your health care rates down. This isn't going to affect Medicare and Medicaid. This is only going to affect working families as they're trying to get health insurance. Because right now, even I can't afford Obamacare. It's going to cost me $1,000 a month, and that's $1,000 that my family and I don't have. But if we opened it up where 50 states insurance companies were fighting for my business, for sure I would be able to afford health insurance then. And then I would be able to sleep easier at night knowing that my wife and children are covered. Part two, the national debt. 
Since I've already discussed that, we know that that's got to be gotten under control. Number three, the federal government currently owns 53% of the state of Oregon, which means we are not even living up to half of our potential. And there's only one representative from Oregon that's trying to stand up to get our land back, and that's Greg Walden. We know that they're trying to block our land usage, but natural resources is the best thing that Oregon has going for them. Since 1980, 290 sawmills have shut down. Thousands of high-paying lumberman jobs have been lost because of this. Let's open up our lands, allow people to use it, allow people to export our natural resources and get jobs going again in Oregon so that we can be a national entrepreneurial destination for every state and for every country to come here to open up business. And number four, let's create or recreate the jobs that have been lost. Now I'm also endorsed across the board here in the district. I've got mayors, I've also got county commissioners, I've got businesses that are supporting me, but most importantly on my campaign team I have four different political parties represented. I have a Republican, I have a Democrat, I have a Libertarian, and I have an Independent. I'm already thinking across the board because with four different parties helping to give suggestions and ideas to me, I am already working across the table with three other parties and I look forward to doing this in Congress as well. Once again, my name is Jason Yates, and I look forward to serving you in Washington. Thank you. Uh, and again, thank you to the Washington County Public Affairs Forum. Now, Jason mentioned the low approval rating of Congress. Yes, Congress has a low approval rating, but a lot of that comes from things like the government shutdown, which the party Jason's running under was responsible for, uh, inspired by Ted Cruz. And a government that we can't see is not the best government. Government plays an important role in people's lives. With regard to the debt, yes, it is an issue we need to address, but we can do this without cutting the important social safety net programs or social security and Medicare. We can find smarter, better ways to do things. We can cut back on uh, unnecessary defense spending. There's a lot of ways we can balance the budget and cut back on the debt without uh, cutting social service programs. A thousand no votes without a yes vote. As someone who's served for two and a half years in Congress, I shudder to think what the record would look like for this district if that happens. Also with regard to jobs, of course we all support, we agree on that. Uh, we need to improve the economy, no question about that. But the, the majority party, which Jason would be a part of in Congress, is not bringing forth long-term bills to bring that certainty that businesses need and deserve. And the Affordable Care Act, I was not in Congress when it passed, but uh, there, uh, there are thousands, millions across the country, thousands of more people who have health insurance coverage now because of the Affordable Care Act. Is it perfect? No. Should we work together to solve the remaining outstanding issues? Absolutely. But repealing it would be a big mistake. We'd open up that donut hole. We'd put back the exclusion for pre-existing conditions and a lot of things that are helping Oregonians and Americans across this country. And buying insurance across state lines is a race to the bottom. Insurance, as Jason knows, is regulated by states. Uh, if you buy insurance for the, the cheapest insurance you can get in a faraway state and then have a problem you can't resolve the issues that's not the way to solve health care so I look forward to answering your questions uh, and I look forward uh, to continuing to represent you in the US Congress with uh, my values and my priorities thank you So the government shutdown that happened last year was a government shutdown of about 17 days. It was not caused by the Republican Party. It was caused by the Democrats who refused to come to the table to discuss valid ways to be able to extend the government and to be able to fund the government. At the Yam Hill town hall meeting last year that Suzanne had, she said during the government shutdown, the U.S. government economy lost about $18 billion. 
But what she doesn't tell you is that right after the clean resolution was passed that she voted for, $365 billion was immediately added to the national debt. That doesn't seem like a fair trade for you because that's money that you have to pay to get the government going again with all the pork barreling and earmarks that were put into that bill. As for insurance, if we look at how car insurance is being handled now, we can buy car insurance over state lines. It's still regulated and it works out for us because they have to answer to car insurance recs, they have to answer to car insurance claims. The same thing would happen with health insurance. They would be regulated. They would still have to answer to claims and to answers and they would have to talk to their, you know, their customers as well. So this is a win-win situation for every state and for the insurance business as well. Because you get affordable health insurance, the government doesn't sit over you and mandate it, which is not allowed in the Constitution, and businesses get to, a, to grow and thrive across 50 different states. So you have a choice. You can choose over-regulation or you can choose freedom. And if you'd like to choose freedom, I look forward to your vote. Thank you. Thank you for your timeliness. At this time, um, I um, actually work for a living. This isn't a full-time paying job. <laughs> Sorry about that. But, um, and I have to be over in court at 1.30. Um, I'm going to introduce um, Rob Solomon, our first vice president. He's going to take over the portion of the questioning, and I'm going to give him the magic red slip. And uh, I'll just point out that we have uh, some programs. Next week, we've got a busy schedule because we've got um, State Treasurer Wheeler School Initiative opposed by Cascade Policy Institute uh, President Steve Buckstein. That's Measure 86, and we've got Measure 88, which is the alien driver's license with um, Jim Ludwig, the proponent, and uh, someone from CAS, uh, maybe Ron Louie. Then, um, then on the 20th, we have open primaries um, the, uh, initiative. 1027 is still an open date, and the reason it's open is because we're thinking that maybe Monica Webby or the um, or Senator Merkley might want to come here and debate in association with Pacific University. So we're leaving that open. It may not be possible for long. So in any event, I'm going to invite Rob up here. Rob is probably going to be the incoming president, too, so he might as well see what the heat's like. Nice to see you. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, what do you mean this isn't a well-paying job? Hmm. We won't tell you that until after. Apparently not. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome again to the forum. And it, it's time for questions. Questions should be less than a minute and as focused as possible. Please identify yourself. Only forum members can ask questions. And we'll look forward to the responses. Please. Um, Jim Cape, forum member. Question about the hot button issue of immigration. It's expected that President Obama will do an immigration reform after the election through executive action. What is your views on immigration reform? Thank you. I want everyone to know that I support legal immigration right now. My ancestors came here from several different countries, England, Sweden, Norway. So my family is a family of immigrants, but they followed the law. They went through the proper channels in their countries, they filed the papers here, they were registered, and they became productive citizens of the country. So if people are willing to follow the laws, I am more than welcome to welcome them into the country and to welcome them as Americans with equal rights across the board. But if they want to come here illegally, jump the border, try to ride in on a truck, try to cheat the system, then absolutely not. Immigration reform is an issue that's important not only to the first district but to Oregon and to the entire country. There are several proposals for immigration reform, including a comprehensive immigration reform bill that has passed the Senate, but that sits in the House. We have not been given an opportunity to vote on comprehensive immigration reform, even though the Senate passed a comprehensive bill more than a year ago. I am more than willing to sit down and work with my colleagues. I'm co-sponsoring a similar comprehensive immigration reform bill in the House, but the Speaker needs to bring it forward for a vote. I'll be watching very carefully the President's, uh, if he does take administrative action, uh, and I understand that he will do so within the boundaries of the law. 
but uh, I understand the president's frustration because the House has not been able to vote on this important issue of comprehensive immigration reform. So I hope we can bring it up for a, a vote so we'll be able to express uh, our opinions and work on a comprehensive immigration bill through the House so that the president will not have to take executive action. Hello, I'm Marilyn McWilliams and I am a forum member. Um, I have a question for Jason Yates. Um, you say on, on your piece here that you um, seek real solutions that provide quality health care insurance by placing the control in the hands of the consumer, not professional bureaucrats. And I understand that you oppose a woman's right to choose. I would like to hear how you, you um, integrate these two ideas, that women should have a right to, to make their own decisions, but they don't have a right to choose whether or not to use birth control. I am a pro-life candidate because every person deserves the chance at life. The Declaration of Independence says that you are endowed with three rights, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. How can you have liberty and pursue happiness if you're not allowed life? Even the Founding Fathers knew that life was important and that pro-life was the way to go. There, inside of a mother's womb are two distinct DNAs which means that there is a second person there. So therefore, it's not your body, it's another person's body. So that's why I'm pro-life, and I, I hope that everyone else can see that way as well. Thank you, Marilyn, for, for bringing up that important issue, uh, because here's one place where I agree that we should have less government. Uh, I don't like abortion. I don't know anyone who, who does like abortion. However, if abortion is illegal, it does not go away, it becomes unsafe. So we need to work together as a community with our healthcare providers to make sure that we're doing everything we can to prevent unwanted pregnancies and then leave the medical decisions up to women and their doctors. I will take that position with me as I did in the legislature. I'm proud to be endorsed by Planned Parenthood because a lot of what they do is prevention. Thank you, Marilyn. John Blackman, forum member. I have a question about the House rules. <clears throat> My understanding is that when you submit a bill, it's sent to the relevant committee for hearings, and then eventually the committee has a vote. And if it is voted down, then that's the end of the bill. Would it be any improvement if instead of that, the committee would recommend or not recommend passage of the bill? Uh, to the full house because this way the member gets an out. Well, I would have voted for it, but it never got to the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John, for that suggestion. And I'm always looking for ways to make Congress work more smoothly. Um, I don't think we need to make that change. I just think we need to have uh, uh, House rules that get a, do away with the biggest change that we should make is to something called the Hastert rule. And that is a sort of unwritten rule that the majority party brings forward a bill for the vote, a vote to the floor that can only pass with the majority of the majority. That has been a problem because there have been many bills that could have passed with the majority of the minority party. Now, Speaker Boehner has brought forward some bills that have passed with the majority of the minority, for example, the Violence Against Women Act that really needed to pass, passed with more Democrats and Republicans supporting it. However, the committee votes, uh, I think it's important for members to, to take a vote. It shows where they stand on the issues. Members can show support or opposition by co-sponsoring legislation. John McWilliams, uh, John McWilliams for a member. Um, I have a question that uh, kind of moves back into the area of education. Uh, I have a chance to listen to POTUS um, and uh, I hear a lot of talk from both sides. Both sides actually talk about STEAM, or STEM, and they have the importance of it. Um, I also think that there's another important part, and that's the A for arts. And uh, could, could you talk, both of you talk a little bit more about the importance of STEAM in uh, our educational process? Thank you, John, for that question. As a member of the Education Committee and the Science Committee, I spend a lot of time talking about the importance of science, technology, engineering, and math. Very important, uh, no doubt. 
but also important is creativity and innovation. So I've actually started a bipartisan caucus, a group of uh, members of Congress from both sides of the aisle who understand the importance of the arts and design broadly defined. We've had a lot of great conversations about the importance of creativity and innovation to our workforce. When we started the caucus uh, about a year and a half ago, we had support from the arts community and of course arts supporters and music educators. Now we have business community support as well. At our last briefing, we had Intel, Boeing, and Lockheed Martin all talking about the importance of creativity and innovation and how we get that from educating and exercising both halves of the brain. Uh, I am a supporter of well-rounded education, uh, especially if we want to be globally competitive. We can't have rote learning. We need creative, innovative thinkers, and that comes from a well-rounded education. So I appreciate your question. I've been working on the STEM to STEAM movement with uh, my bar bipartisan caucus and with also with leaders, for example, the former president of the Rhode Island School of Design, who's a former MIT professor and OHSU Brain Institute and many different colleagues are and stakeholders uh, are supporting this effort. In fact, uh, there's a Beaverton school not too far from here. Um, uh, Highland Park Middle School that has a great STEAM program. Hillsboro Quatama Elementary School is incorporating arts into their STEM learning so students are making better connections between science and art. They both involve risk taking and thinking outside the box. So it's a great movement um, and I appreciate your bringing up the issue. Thank you. My family is heavily in the arts program as well. My wife went to school for culinary arts. I went to school for English and for film studies. Um, my brother-in-law went to school for a an, an, uh, foreign language. So the arts are very important to our family. So I will be fighting for more arts education um, to be taught in the schools, not just in high schools and colleges, but also in middle school and elementary schools to well round the students out. But I don't think this should be a federal issue, this should be a state issue, so that each state issue can find out what, how, the be, how is the best way to integrate this into their programs. So uh, I do support the arts, and I thank you for the question. Harry Bodine, foreign member, and this one's coming from left field. Uh, as I look at Congress today, I see the House marching in one direction, the Senate marching in another, and very little cooperation, basically, on the major, major issues facing the country. Would we be better off if we basically rewrote the Constitution, went to a Canadian system, where you put your eggs in one basket, one legislative body, and you put that group in charge, and so somebody's responsible for what happens. And this is with, accompanied by no gerrymandering of election districts. They got away from that 40 years ago. And uh, it's not perfect, but at least you get something happened. Because to me, what we have now is a totally collapsed system. I'll have to respectfully disagree with you on this. I, I think that the founding fathers knew that there would be some problems that would come up in the future, but the safeguards that are built into the Constitution, even right now, will help us through this lull as the two major parties fight against each other, and it will end up balancing out. Then we're going to be able to save our sovereignty and our Constitution, because if we rewrite the Constitution, there's no telling what may make it in there and how dangerous those implications may have on the future of America. Thank you for the question, Harry. Nice to see you. Uh, I know people are frustrated and see what is often referred to as a do-nothing Congress. And I'm, I'm here to say that I don't think we, I agree with Jason on this one, I don't think we need to rewrite the Constitution. We need to send more people to Congress who are willing to set aside their differences and work together, as I have done in many instances, from the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act to the tsunami bill to many weather forecasting bill, lots of things that I have worked on on a bipartisan basis. We need people who will step away from partisan politics when they get to the Capitol 
put aside their differences, find common ground. Now, I have done that in many instances, as I mentioned. Another example is when I heard from our federal defender here in Oregon that the, the budget cuts were affecting uh, people's right to counsel. That's a constitutional right. People still get a lawyer. If they cut the budget, they have to go to a more expensive panel attorney. So I went to a Republican colleague who used to be a U.S. attorney, and she said, let's work together and, and uh, uh, fight back against those cuts to the to public defender's budget. So we need more people who are willing to work together. I believe in the bicameral system. I think it's important for uh, legislation to be heard in two places. This is important legislation. It's affecting the whole country. Do we still have some big things to do to work together? Yes, but there are some positive signs. I mentioned the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act. I'm hopeful that we can do a long-term transportation bill when we get back and also tackle that issue of immigration reform. I know there's bipartisan support there if we could just get the bill forward for a vote. Thank you for your question. I'm Phil Nelson, forum member. This is a community college question, and I'm hoping both of you feel able to answer this. I saw in the paper the other day that apparently community colleges will not receive federal funds uh, if their default rate on student loans exceeds a certain percentage, either 30 or 35 percent, and that there are some community colleges in Oregon which are in jeopardy of losing uh, federal support because of this. Could you comment on that, please, and see if there's any correction coming? I would be happy to, Phil. As a graduate of Lane Community College, I spent my first two years of college there. I very much appreciate the importance of community colleges. I also understand the need to make sure that our uh, student debt problem is addressed. Right now in this country, student loan debt has ex is exceeding consumer debt, which is something I'd be very, very concerned about if that continues to grow. Now that particular issue, I am more than happy to look into the details and see where that's coming from and what we can do about it because we need to make sure that our community colleges here that play, uh, play such an important role in people's education are supported and do not lose that federal funding and the ability of students who are getting uh, federal student loans to attend those community colleges. My sense is that uh, the, the, the movement is certainly to make sure that the, the very um, let's just say that the, the for-profit colleges are problematic because many times people take large student loans and then uh, get a degree that is not worth the money that they paid. So we need to make sure that we aren't overcorrecting for that problem and having that affect community colleges, but I'm more than happy to look into the details and if there's anything I can do to make sure that our community colleges don't lose funding and that students don't lose the ability to use their federal financial aid uh, at community colleges, I'll do everything I can. And I, I want to point out that uh, uh, we have seen, for example, in the, the Ryan budget that was proposed uh, by House leadership that I did not support, would cut Pell Grants. I do not support cutting Pell Grants. I see education as a way to improve opportunity for everyone in this country, and making it harder for low-income students to go to college is not the right path. So this issue is once again um, an overreach by the federal government taking on responsibilities that's not granted to them in the Constitution. This becomes a Ninth and Tenth Amendment once again, so it reverts to the state. Each state should be able to help their students get to a community college. One way we could do that here in Oregon is to open up the 53% of our land so that timber industry can get going again, so that money could be funneled in not just to you know, primary education, but secondary, and then into community colleges and to colleges. Because if we have this land being able to be used for natural resources, we'll be able to pay for our students to go to college. Then we won't have to burden the national budget even further by paying for these loans when the state can handle it just as well. Then it takes a regulation barrier from the federal government and take some of that weight off so that they can actually handle issues that are helping with the economy. So it's not that this would be cut, but it would just be reverted to each state to be able to handle and raise money for schooling. Patrick Wheeler, farm member. Looks like we're getting into another war with ISIS in the Middle East. What's your opinion on that? <clears throat> The United States needs to stop 
becoming a nanny state of the world. We're not a police state, and our sons and our daughters are not the babysitters of the world. We don't need to be running off to every corner of the world as soon as there's a little flare up. What we need to do is we need to defend our own country, defend our own borders, and defend our own citizens. And unless we're actually under attack, we don't need to send our children overseas to defend our country. Right now, we don't need boots on the ground over there. We need boots on the ground here. Because right now we have crime rates going through the roof, especially over in Detroit. We have illegals crossing the border. We need to defend our own country. So I, I don't support the, the war on ISIS right now because it is, it, this is not, the, the national security threat is here in the country, not overseas. Thank you, Pat Patrick, for the question. I, I, I take it very, very seriously. I know the nation is war weary. I know we've lost too many lives in Iraq and Afghanistan. But the problem with ISIS is not a little flare up, as my opponent just said. It's a serious issue that we have to take seriously. And even though I don't sit on the Intelligence Committee or the Armed Services or the Foreign Affairs Committee, I have done everything I can through classified briefings and conversations with people on those committees to educate myself about the threat that face us here in this country from uh, what's happening with ISIS in, in the Middle East. And if we look at instability in the Middle East, that does affect our country. And there have been threats to our country. So I take it very seriously. We did not vote on an authorization for use of military force. The strikes that are happening right now are being conducted under the existing authorization of use of military force from uh, Iraq uh, that authorizes strikes against Al Qaeda and its affiliates, which include ISIS. If we vote on it again, uh, if, when we come back, if we have a vote on the use of military force, again, I will do everything I can to educate myself about the exact provisions, what we're voting on, uh, the, the length, the terms, and, and really listen to my constituents, but also listen to uh, the experts who are on the ground there with the intelligence that they have about how this is threatening uh, our, our nation. Uh, the instability there is part of ma what's making Americans feel unstable. We need to do what we can with uh, our uh, coalition, international coalition uh, with, without uh, entering a war, but we need to do what we can to stop this uh, growing uh, surge of terrorism. I want to thank both of you for your uh, thoughtful answers. Uh, I think that Freddie provides interesting information for all of us. Uh, I'm John McWilliams, foreign member, uh, coming back for round two for me. Um, I'm also thinking about another war that we have that's really affecting the entire world, in my opinion, and that of others too, and that's climate change. Um, climate change is a real problem, as I see it. Uh, if elected, or when elected, are you, uh, what are you going to do to uh, help us out so that maybe we can do something to stop climate change? Thank you, John, for that question. Climate change is real, it's serious, and as a member of the Science, Space, and Technology Committee and the ranking member on the Environment Committee, I have sat through several hearings listening to the international uh, experts and scientists about the threats of climate change. When I'm in Yamhill County talking to people who grow uh, Pinot Noir grapes down there, they're concerned if the temperatures rise. I want that industry to stay in Yamhill County, not have to move up to Washington or British Columbia. When I'm talking with people who uh, work in the nursery industry, same thing. Uh, our farmers are concerned about drought. Our outdoor recreation industries are concerned about a snowpack. Look at what's happening in California with the drought and the proliferation of extreme weather events across the country. Carbon emissions are too high. We need to work together to find a solution. We can do that across party lines. Unfortunately, the Science Committee has attracted people who do not believe that humans contribute to climate change, even though every expert who has testified, every scientific ex expert does believe that. So we need to work together. We need to set aside our differences. We need to look at how this is affecting our industries, our planet, and our economy, and find ways. We have so much potential here in Oregon with renewable technologies and investing in technology that can help drive down the costs of, of renewable energy. 
we have a lot that we can do. Uh, and Jason mentioned his children. I have children as well. Mine are older, but I hope to someday have grandchildren and think about the world that, that our children and our grandchildren will inherit. It's a, this is a critical issue. This is uh, something that we need to, to, to tackle. And I, I thank you so much for bringing up this issue. Let's talk about some facts here. Climate change is real, but let's call it what it really is. It's called weather, and weather fluctuates. Over the last 100 years, the temperature here in the United States has only gone up one degree, and that is because the scientists have proven this. Every reli reliable scientist has proven that it has been a wind change pattern over the North Pacific that has changed the degree one degree. Climate change being affected by humans is a minuscule, minuscule change. Mount St. Helens, when it erupted, spewed more carbon dioxide and monoxide into the air than the entire history of mankind. So if we're worried about mankind affecting the national and global weather system, then all we need to do is look at one major volcanic eruption that outdoes all history of mankind. Chris Leslie, forum member, thank you again both for being here. I like to stir up the pot. Uh, what would you cut if you cut anything in Washington? And how would you do it? This is an important thing. I feel that a lot of our problems today are self-made media generalizations to scare people into voting one way or another. But I feel that you can tell us the truth about what you would cut to save some money in that trillion dollar budget. Even with tax reform, you have a trillion dollars in dividends sitting overseas that doesn't come back because the companies don't want to be double taxed again. Just on these subjects, you can pick out what you want. Please go ahead and answer. One of the first things that would be cut in a perfect world would be the Federal Department of Education, and that would fall back to each of the 50 states then to be able to decide what education is best for their students. The NSA would be second on the list, and the IRS would be third on the list. The reason why I would get rid of the NSA is because of the Fourth Amendment of the United States Constitution says that there should be no un un unreasonable searches. Well, when they are tapping into your phone line, tapping into your email, that's illegal. That's your private business, and it should stay private between you and yourself. Um, as for the um, IRS, the new tax code comes out every year. Is it really that big of a difference that it's different taxes than last year? What we need to do is get rid of that and just put a flat tax across the board. Here's what corporations pay, here's what people pay. And then everybody is exactly the same, no matter how much money you make, it's a flat tax. If you're a billionaire, you pay a good chunk of your business. If you're, if you're lower class, then you just pay a small amount. So those are the three programs that I would eliminate right off the bat if it was a perfect world. Thank you, Chris, for your question. I just want to take just a couple seconds to respond to an earlier answer of, of Jason's about climate change. It's very important. Weather is two weeks out. Everything past that is climate. So when Jason said that climate change is basically weather, that's just not correct. So uh, I served on the budget committee, and I want to clarify that uh, my work on the budget committee, I, I know that there are lots of places that we can find smarter, better ways to do things. I certainly would not eliminate the Federal Department of Education. They have many important federal programs like Title I for our low-income schools, IDEA for uh, indiv individuals with uh, disabilities, Education Act. And I, and I can't imagine cutting the IRS. How in the world would we collect the revenue we need to run the government? So we can find, again, smarter, better ways to do things. There are a lot of places we can cut in the very large defense budget. Uh, when I heard the defense secretary testify, he said where we really need investment is in intelligence. Uh, in infrastructure, so that, that intelligence is what we really need. Uh, cybersecurity is important, but there's a lot of military hardware that we don't. And again, streamlining government, I have a bill called the Government Reporting Efficiency
Emergency Act. When I found out that the federal government, the Congress gets about uh, more than 4,000 reports from agencies every year, and they continue to come in, and they require agency work to prepare, uh, and they continue coming even though they're not necessary because they don't end. I have a bipartisan bill with a Republican from Utah to make those sunset, so we save money uh, for the agencies preparing those reports. That's just one example of the smarter, better ways that we can do things, but my goodness, if we Got, a, got rid of the IRS, we would have no revenue, uh, and a flat tax is a very, very regressive. So uh, we, Jason and I have very different priorities in this regard. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, this is quite a bit of fun. I like the asking questions. I'm going to try one more time. So uh, I'm um, a little bit concerned about the uh, situation that we have uh, when it regards uh, equal pay for equal work. And coming up on the ballot, I believe, we're, is going to be the uh, ERA. And uh, so I'm kind of wondering, do you have a point of view on that? Do you favor it, or do you uh, think it's just something that should be voted down? Thank you. I support the Equal Rights Amendment. Uh, women should are and should be uh, recognized in our state constitution as being equal to men. I have absolutely no problem with that. Uh, I have to say that uh, as the only woman in the delegation, I'm proud to be a leader uh, and a supporter of the Equal Rights Amendment. Equal pay for equal work has actually been the law since 1963. I was a little girl then, uh, but it still is not the case that uh, every woman gets equal pay for equal work. And I want to emphasize the four equal work part. You can't just take all the men and divide their salaries and all the women and divide their salaries. It's equal pay for equal work and women still are not getting it. I was proud to stand with Lily Ledbetter uh, when she came to Portland, a leader in the equal pay for equal work movement. Uh, I'm a proud supporter of the Paycheck Fairness Act to make sure that women are getting equal pay for equal work. One of the simple things that the Paycheck Fairness Act does, if we could get it passed, would be to allow women to talk with others in their, their workplace about how much they make. Some companies forbid that so that women don't know. Lily Ledbetter found out because she got an anonymous note telling her that she was not making the same, significantly less than the women in her, her uh, company. So yes, women deserve equal pay for equal work. It's been the law since 1963. It's time to make it a reality and pass the Paycheck Fairness Act. I absolutely agree that all men are created equal. That includes all women as well. But the thing is, it would be a redundant law. It's already on the book, as Suzanne said. So what we need to do is we need to follow the rules that are on the book instead of adding more to it. So I, I would actually vote no on it, but then really support the laws that are on the book to make sure that everyone gets the equal pay for equal work. We can squeeze in one more question, and we'll try and make it quick. Go ahead, Chris. Chris Leslie, former member, again, the second by the apple. But uh, this is an easy one. What would you really push in Washington when you're there, each individually, as a part of your party platform or your own personal platform? What is the most important thing you can do in Washington? Right now, with over 3,000 new laws and regulations passing through the federal government onto your backs every year, the most important thing we can do right now is deregulate as many things as we can to get that load off of you, your children, and your grandchildren to make this a land of freedom instead of a land of regulation. Thank you, Chris, for the question. And as I travel around this great district uh, and talk to people, the most important issue is stability in the economy. So I would do several things to help rebuild the economy. First of all, improving public education and access to higher education is so important. And we can do that. Uh, education is a key to, to uh, the economy. Also, a long-term transportation and infrastructure bill. We had the transportation secretary here in Portland last week talking about how we need a long-term bill, not a short-term bill for transportation. Our roads and bridges and uh, waterways are so important to uh, get people to work, to get goods to market. We need to rebuild uh, in a, the long term. 
we can't hire construction projects and plan them in the short term. We were only able because the House majority only put up a short term transportation bill. That would make a tremendous difference. And finally, a comprehensive tax and immigration reform would make a big difference to our economy and to stability. If we could get those things done, they're all related to the economy. The Congressional Budget Office, which is a nonpartisan organization, said that the immigration reform bill would be a, a huge benefit to our economy. So would comprehensive tax reform, long-term infrastructure, and improving education. So all under the umbrella of stabilizing and improving our economy. Thank you, Chris, for the question. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to a close as far as our formal program is concerned. Just a couple of quick announcements. First of all and foremost, thank you so much to both candidates for being here. And as a fairly long time member of the forum, I am always impressed with the decorum of the forum. And today, I'm sorry for the rhyme, but today it still worked. Thank you for making my job much easier as far as the timing is concerned. That's to the candidates and to the questioners as well. We're very fortunate in our relationship here with this restaurant, and I've been asked to remind folks if they wouldn't be, if they wouldn't mind, don't forget to tip your servers. They've been wonderful for us for months, and they do a very good job. Ladies and gentlemen, the TV portion of our program comes to a close. Thank you very much. <laughs>